or tape, CDs, DVDs to our publication, Voices from His Excellent Glory, Declaring the Kingdom, write P.O. Box 21516, Hot Springs, Arkansas, Zip 71903. Our website is www.lakehamiltonbiblecamp.com and lhbconline.com. There are many free audio files there. It's like going to Bible school at home. Thank you. This is the Summer Family Camp Meeting being held at Lake Hamilton Bible Campgrounds, Hot Springs National Park, Arkansas. Sunday morning, June the 30th, 1996. George Wingate of Jacksonville, Florida is the speaker of the morning. You didn't know George was a singer, did you? And to those of you who've never heard him or saw him before, he's a deliverance minister, and he works uh, uh, in the Jacksonville, Florida area, uh, and he's a fisherman. And he brought us uh, fish for a fish fry the 4th of July. We're going to have a, a picnic and a fish fry the 4th of July, thanks to Brother George Wingate. Sun new and living way, walk in it. It's a new and living way God has planned. In this new and living way, I am walking day by day, guided and led by His right hand. God loves you and I love you and that's good enough for me. God loves you and I love you and that's the way it's going to be. Sing it. God loves you and I love you and that's the way it's going to be. God loves you and I love you and that's good enough for me. I love to sing. I love to praise the Lord. I, I, I love to just shout it out about the blood of Jesus. And I found that when the enemy rushes in, and he does quite often, that I've got a standard that I can lift up against him. And that standard is the promises in the Word of God. I mean, every one of them is a sharp two-edged sword. And if I can't hit him with one side of it, I'll sling it back the other way and get him on the other side. Glory to God. Well, hallelujah. How many of you love Jesus this morning? Oh, come on now. We can do better than that. Let me give you just a little bit of information as to why you should really love him with all of your whole heart. This is just a little freebie. Out of a total of 31,102 verses in the Bible, 7,670 verses, or nearly one verse in four, concern the theme of salvation. This includes over 1,900 verses on the necessity of holy living. 2,531 verses on the temporal punishment of the wicked. 413 verses on the future punishment of the wicked, 575 verses which show God's love for the sinner, and 182 verses which show that God is no respecter of persons, but saves all who are willing to meet the conditions of salvation. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Remember that, that God's no respecter of persons. What he does for one, he will do for any and everybody that will simply take him at his word. Now... Out of 23,145 verses in the Old Testament, 4,736 have some bearing on man's need of salvation or on the way of salvation. And 2,934 verses out of a total of 7,957 in the New Testament are also concerning the salvation of mankind. Salvation. Lord, I thank you for your word. And Lord, as I've said earlier this morning, I just make myself, God, available to you. And Lord, I sense an awesome responsibility in sharing your word. And I ask you, Holy Spirit, just simply to take over this being. I step aside by faith and I say, Holy Spirit, just move in, have your way, say what you want said, quicken this mortal body. 
that it'll come forth with clarity, that it'll come forth evenly, and, Lord, that all of us will be blessed. Now, Father God, in Jesus' name, I give you the praise and the glory for all that you have done and for all that you are doing and for all that you are going to continue to do. We love you, Lord. We ask you to help us to love you more. In Jesus' name, amen. Many years ago, when I first began this walk that I'm in with God, the Lord just, I got so hungry for the Lord, and I was just open to go anywhere God said at any time. And as God began to take me here and there to different camp meetings, little home meetings, some churches, Along the way, I would really pick up some good information, and, I, and the Lord just instructed me to make sure that I got some copies of what was being taught, that I would keep it, study it, meditate in it, and some of it I've had for over 25 years. Somewhere, I, I, this one I don't particularly have, but the Lord has never let it get away from me, and it concerns the four chapters of Romans 5, 6, 7, and 8, and I call it the four Ps. Brother Tommy, I understand, has got a book up back there about the three Ps. And we're going to look at one of these this morning. But let me just tell you that chapter 5 is the promise. The very first verse says, Therefore, being justified by faith, I have peace with God through the Lord Jesus Christ. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. And without faith, it's impossible to please God. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. That word diligently is not in there just by accident. It's there for a purpose. There's too much haphazardness within the body of Christ as a whole. There's too much lackadaisicalness. There's too much wasted time. Time is a borrowed trust from eternity. And once it's gone, it's gone. You can't call it back. If I were to ask you, if I were just to ask you just one question, and that is, what did you do with the hours, the minutes, the seconds of this past week? Was it all spent for the glory of God? Did everything you do give glory to God? It's an awesome thought. It's an awesome thought. Number five, therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And number six, not very long there, just one word, problem. Problem. And chapter seven is provision. Provision. And chapter eight is the power. I challenge you to go through those verses and the days, those chapters and the days to come and dig out of them the meat and the vegetables, the desserts that's there. Some good eating. Some very good eating. We're going to take a look at the problem today. And then after we look at some scriptures here, if I can, if, as the Lord directs, I've got a list here. And up at the top it says, I am. Yes. Most of us have yet to learn who we are in Christ. Paul talks an awful lot about being in him, in whom, in Christ, in, in Ephesians. And we need to know who we are in Christ. We'll never walk in victory until we do come to that realization of who we are in Christ. We'll live an up and down life. We'll be carnally minded one minute and spiritually minded the next. Everything will go good today, and tomorrow it won't go good. And we'll be flowing in and out, up and down. That's not God's plan for us. Not at all. First verse says, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? First John 3, 8 says, He that committeth sin is of the devil. I don't want to be of the devil in any way, shape, or form. So that means I'm going to have to do some separating. That means I'm going to have to learn how to differentiate or to discern what comes to my mind. 
That means I'm going to have to learn to take authority over every thought that comes to my mind. And in order to do that, that means that I'm going to have to have some willpower. That means that I'm going to have to exercise some discipline. That means that I'm going to have to deny self. And when it all comes right down to the nitty-gritty, it means I'm going to have to die. But if you're all like I am, a lot of the times I just kind of, well, I don't want to. Well, I don't feel like praising the Lord right now. Well, who said you had to feel like it? God has made us so absolutely wonderful, fearful. We've been given the five senses to enjoy God's creation. We have a very subtle, crafty, cunning sly, slick enemy that loves to slip in in one or more of those gates and begin to raise havoc in our lives. We need to learn how to shut those five gates to the devil. We can do it. And that's the whole key to deliverance. Get the devils out, shut the gates, and refuse to let him come back in. It can be done. It must be done. Jesus said that he was going to have a people that would do all kinds of things in his name. Jesus said in Luke 10, 19, Behold, I give to you power over all the power of the devil, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Nothing. That means when somebody comes up and says something crude or rude or whatever, you just say, oh, well, praise the Lord. That means when you're out there driving on the highway and that person zooms right around in front of you and then puts his brakes on, turns right there, you just say, bless him, Lord. Help him get where he's going, God. Uh, I'm sure all of us do that, you know. And yes, we could just go on and on in situations where we have to change our attitude. I have a handout that I'm going to get some copies made, and I'll give you one perhaps later on. And it says this, Do not allow yourself to become upset by people or things. They are powerless. Your reaction is their only power. Nice little sheet of paper with a sort of a border around it. Get it made, give everybody one of them, take it home, stick it up on your refrigerator somewhere where you can see it every day. That means when the cat runs screaming across the floor, you don't even get angry at him. What shall we say? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Are you dead to sin? <clears throat> Romans 7, 4 says, Wherefore, my brethren, you also are become dead to the law by the body of Christ, that you should be married to another, even to him who is raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. Bring forth fruit unto God. You remember what Jesus said in John 15? He said, I am the vine, you are the branches. If you bear fruit, I'll prune you so you'll bear more fruit. All of us, as born-again, spirit-baptized Christians, Little situations and things happen. God's pruning us. Most of the time we kick and squirm. And we don't want to get pruned. We hang on. But if we could just let go. Say, okay, God, that's, you know, just cut it off. What did it say? Your right eye offend you? Pluck it out. But I want to. I want both eyes. God says, well, when you get tired of rebelling against what I'm trying to do to you, all I want to do is bless you. It all boils down, brothers and sisters, to taking God at his word. Hey, this isn't just a book. It's a person talking to us. It's a person who loves us more than we can ever comprehend. It's a person who wants to bless us beyond all of our expectations. It's a person who has made a way for you and I to walk in this sin-riddled world without sin. Hallelujah. 
I get so excited about what God is showing and revealing of himself. I wish it was some way that I could just, you know, tear this thing out page for page and, and eat it. Just devour it. Because here again, in, in, in coming to some knowledge of, of the mechanism of this body, how that we can ingest food and, and the body, the chemistry of the body takes every bit of the nutrition out of that food and applies it to our whole being. And how, how glorious it is to, to, to just look at the little children. They're, they're, there's a perfect replica of a human being, but only in a small stage. And yet that, that person is, is growing like we all have, all evenly, all in perfect order. Our God's a God of order. Come here, sir. Do you know that many of us, in the eyes of God, are like this little girl? Oh, we might be even up to my age of 72, but still in the eyes of God, we're like a little child. But God don't want us to stay little children. He wants us to grow up. He wants us to become like this gentleman sitting back here by a dock. I think he's about 6'5", perhaps, 6'4", 6'4". Go ahead. And he wants us in the spirit to become even bigger. He wants us to be replicas, if you please, of Jesus Christ. Jesus said, what I've done, you will do. That's not an option, folks. That's a command. He utterly, absolutely defeated the devil. How did he do it? He said, it is written. It is written. Galatians 2.19 says, For I through the law am dead to the law, that I might live unto God. Galatians 6.14 says, But God forbid that I should glory, save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. A lot of us would like to stop right there and leave the rest of it out. But it's in the Word. And it says, By whom the world is crucified unto me, and I unto the world. God help us to get... The world out of us. The world has got to come out of us because God's not going to take us out of the world. But he does want the world out of us. So that others may see the good works of God in us. And thereby glorify the Father who is in heaven. We're to be living epistles read of all men. Jesus said, let your light so shine that others may see the good works of God in you. And that goes along with a scripture that says in, in 2 Corinthians, we hear a lot about it in 10. It says, The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Well, that's all well and good. Thank you, Lord. Got to share the rest of that. Thank you, Lord. Casting down imaginations or reasonings. Where, the, where are those things at? Right up here. And every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God. A headache? That's a high thing exalts itself against the knowledge of God as far as we Christians are concerned because God's already taken care of that headache. Or any other situation or circumstance that comes along our way. God says, hey, you're victorious. You're the victor, not the victim. The Word says, in everything give thanks for this is the will of God and Christ Jesus concerning you. Rejoice in the Lord every once in a while. Oh, I didn't say that right, did I? Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. You mean, Brother George, if I go out there and somebody's let the, tire, the air out of my tires, I'm, I'm, I'm just supposed to rejoice? Yes. Thank you, Lord. Maybe God just allowed that to happen because he looks down beyond what we can see. And he saw if you left at the moment you wanted to and got out there, you'd be right in the path of that oncoming car and you'd get clobbered. But by those tires being down here, having to be pumped back in, a little time taken. You know, we got a whole lot more time. We got money. A little time taken, your life is spared. I've been on the highway traveling years ago, not lately. And I've had God prod me, slow down. Slow down. I'd slow down a little bit, and I'd, a couple of times I can remember, slow down. Why? Because the Lord looked on down the, down, down the road and saw that situation that would have, could have been very, very detrimental or even death to me. 
Let me tell you something. Every one of us that ha- that, that's been born again, we've been baptized in the Holy Ghost. You are a powerhouse for God. Whether you realize it or not, you are a powerhouse for God and the devil hates you. He would love to put your light out. Anything that he can do to hinder your walk with God, he's going to do it. That's the reason that we're not to be ignorant of his devices. And he's got a bunch of them. Casting down every imagination and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Most of the time we stop right there, but that next verse is extremely important. And, and having in a readiness to revenge all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. When your obedience is fulfilled. You want to see the power of God move and work? You want to see some really old-time, old-fashioned Holy Ghost power? Then get your obedience fulfilled. My heart's cry is, Oh, God created me a clean heart and renew a right spirit within me. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my strength and my Redeemer. Praise the Lord. The eye of the Lord runs to and fro throughout the whole earth, looking for some more people like old Smith Wigglesworth, John G. Lake, just to name a couple. Let's get on back to Romans 6, and we're looking at some more Scripture. Colossians 3, 3 says, For you are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. For you are dead. The enemy comes along, and he dangles a little little something in front of you, and, you know, you just raise up, and you stop being dead. i tell you what, most of us as, as, as Christians, we, we, we're resurrected. Wrongly. Old Slewfoot seems to have our number. He knows how to resurrect. Well, such and such a program is about to come. Oh, yeah, let's... uh, We get resurrected right away. All kinds of worldly things. But you know what? Our God's a jealous God. He has espoused us to one husband. God says, I don't want to share you with all the other stuff out there. In fact, my Bible says some very strange things, I guess. It says, Come out from amongst them, and be ye separate unto yourselves, saith the Lord, and I will receive you. But Lord, I want to hold on to you, but I also want to get over here a little bit. It also says, Have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. Unfruitful works of darkness. Folks, we've got to take stock of where we're at. We've got to stop allowing the enemy to steal our time through the sense of sight and hearing. First Peter 2.24 says, Who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree, that we being dead to sins should live unto righteousness by whose stripes you were healed. Hmm. All right. <clears throat> Romans 6, verse 3, Know ye not that so many of us, as were baptized into Jesus Christ, were baptized into his death? When Jesus died on the cross, the plan of the Father was that everybody in the entire world died right then with him. Now, Jesus had to do that in obedience to the Father to take our place so that God just wouldn't have to just come down and kill the whole mess. So in the eyes of God, every one of us, without Jesus, as we were at one time, were dead in trespasses and sins. We were dead. But when Jesus, the Spirit of God, began to say, Hey, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden. Come. We find ourselves in a church or in a meeting or whatever, and we don't quite understand how we got there, but maybe it was because of all the troubles we had or were having. And then the preacher, evangelist, teacher or whatever shares the Word of God and something stirs on the inside of us and there's kind of a hunger going on and 
He says, now, if any of y'all want to change your lives, you know, get up here and get saved, whatever, some, you know. And we run, almost run, because we are tired of the way we've been living and we want to change. So we get born again. We, we lay aside all of our preconceived ideas, or should, and we become as a little child, and we say, oh God, have mercy on me. God says, all right, I will. And things begin to happen. <clears throat> and down inside, there's a hunger that begins to really stir. It's a hunger for more of God. It's a hunger for the Word of God. But this thing up here keeps getting in the way. No, I think I, I want something over here. No, I think I need to go over there. All situations, the enemy is doing his utmost to keep us from fellowship, from communion with God. All through the process of thought. We need our minds renewed, made over by the Word of God. There's no substitute for it. And I'm going to tell you something. Heaven and earth will pass away, but the Word of God abides forever. The more of the Word I get inside of me, the more secure I am in knowing that I have eternal life. Second Corinthians 5, 17, Therefore, if any man be, the little word be is a verb, means action. You've got to do something. James 1, says, Be doers of the Word and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. So if you read, study, meditate in the Word of God, and you know, just learn it up, up one side and down the other, but you don't do it, you're deceiving yourself. Again, the Word of God is a book of action. You're not saved to sit. You're saved to serve. Right. The first thing you've got to do is learn how to serve the Lord. Worship, praise, adore, love, obey. Galatians 6.15 For in Christ Jesus neither circumcision availeth anything nor uncircumcision but a new creature. Little by little he's changing me. I'm not the same old person I used to be. It's slow going but there's a knowing that one day like him I will be. Ephesians 4, 22 through 24, that you put off, put off. That means lay aside, does it not? You got a hat on, you're going to take it off, you put it off. That you put off concerning the former conversation. How do you have a former conversation? It's what your mind has been trained in or with. You've, you've had a certain kind of a job at a certain kind of a place, and all of a sudden you don't have that job anymore. You go over to another area and you get another job. You've got to learn to talk that kind of lingo. You can't talk this old job. If you do, you get fired off of your new job. You've got to learn to put off that stuff and get over here and learn about this new vocation. <clears throat> so we must learn. Of course, I, I know now, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm just sharing with folks that, that already know this, but take it back and share it with somebody else. That you put off concerning the former conversation, the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lust. Lust. Oh, but now, Brother George, I don't lust after men. I don't lust after women. Hey, there's more to it than that, folks. You can lust after candy bars. You can lust after cold drinks or any other thing. Anything that in any ways controls you that, you, that your mind says, I've just got to have. That's lusting after it. And if that's any, any kind of a situation has is, is got a hold of a person in that way, it's also idolatry. I don't have to have anything but more of Jesus. I want more of Jesus than I've ever had before. I want more of His great love, so rich and full and free. I want more of Jesus 
so I'll give him more of me. Ephesians 4, 23, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that you put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. Put on the new man. That's Jesus. Colossians 3, 10, and have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge, after the image of him that created him. It's coming a time and a people that's going to do exploits in God. You remember what happened along about the time Jesus was about to come along? A lot of fear was going on. They decided they'd kill all the babies, hoping to get to the one. Isn't that right? Could it be that the very reason that we have this millions of, of uh, abortions and, and all the little children being kidnapped and used for devil worship and so on that's going on, could it be that the same thing is happening again, that the devil's terrified that, that, that there's going to be that certain someone's come along? So he's got to try to get rid of all. Somebody, if, if it comes to that point and my head gets chopped off, I say, God, would you just take everything that's out of that head and out of that spirit and, and, and whatever I've got of your word, would you just take it and plant it in somebody else and make them twice as dangerous as I am? Romans 6, 5, For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. Think about it. In the likeness of his resurrection. If you've got eternal life, you're not going to die anymore either. Say, so wait a minute now. What do you mean? When I look at you, I don't see you. I only see the house you live in. The real you as a spirit being. You've got life with God. In fact, you've been joined to God. The Bible says he that's joined to the Lord is one spirit. Think about it. You've been joined to God. God is a spirit. And we that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. You are part and parcel of almighty God. Everywhere you go, God goes. Everywhere God goes, you go. You're inseparable. Doesn't make a difference what your head says. God has used your body to bring you here at this place at this time. So that you can be strengthened in the power of his might. So that you can feast on the word of God. Grow up a little bit more. Become a little bit more mature. And be more dangerous to the kingdom of darkness than you ever were before. It's exciting beyond words, to know that we are a danger to the enemy, to Satan, to his kingdom. Verse 6, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. That we should not serve sin. Psalm 19, 13 says, Keep back thy servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Then shall I be upright, and I shall be innocent from the great transgression. You think thoughts. Or at least you think you think thoughts. Where do your thoughts come from? Are they just your making? Or is somebody else? making them. In working with people in the area of deliverance, I've had all kinds of thoughts become words that were spoken out of a person telling me all kinds of things. Well, I make this person do thus and such. Well, this person belongs to me. man came to me one time. Somebody, I don't know who'd say him, and he said, I, I've been told that you can help me with some problems. I said, well, I'll do my best. Jesus is really the, the source of all of our help, and I'll trust him to guide me. I said, why don't you just sit down there and talk to me about what's going on? And I just happened to have a pencil and a pad in my hand. And he began to talk, and the Spirit of God, through discernment, began to give me some words. I began to write down these words. You know, resentment, bitterness, hate. And when he got through with all of it, I got a list about so long. 
And I said, he stopped, and I said, well, is that about the size of it? Yeah, that's, that's about the way it is. He was a messed up person. So I turned the list, and I said, well, this is what you need to get rid of. These are spirits residing within you. And you're giving them a place by an act of your will, by doing what they say, and they're making you think that it's you. And he looked at the list, and he looked at me. He said, Brother George, if I got rid of all of that, there wouldn't be nothing left of me. I said, let me tell you something, dear brother. You get rid of all of that, and the real you can shine forth. You're made in God's image. And God is love and peace and joy, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. And against such there is no law. Whatever it is, whatever idiosyncrasy that we might have that's negative in any way, we need to get rid of it. The Bible says if you'll draw nigh to God, he'll draw nigh to you. How am I going to draw nigh to God? Get out there in the middle of nowhere and whoop and holler and I say, Oh, God, here I am. Come on, God. No, that's not the way you're going to do it. You're going to get your Bible and you're going to get quiet and you're going to say, God, I'm drawing nigh to you. Talk to me. God, I'm going to hear you with my eyes. Talk to me. And I set my will, God, whatever you say, I will do it. I know I've been a, you know, I've been around her, God. I've, you know, I'm, out of my mouth comes all kinds of profanity and stuff. But God, if I see in your word, you say don't do it. Then if I, I'll just absolutely, I'll set my will and I will stop it. God says, good, I'll help you. There'll be times when we'll have a problem and we'll do our utmost to quit it. We don't seem to be able to make it. Why? God says, hey, if you do it, then you're going to have pride and give yourself the glory for it. God says, all right, I'll tell you what I want you to do. I want you just to give that thing to me. Just say, okay, God, I can't do it. Here it is. I give it to you. Then three or four weeks later, you wonder where it went. Our God's a loving God, and he wants desperately to bless us beyond all of our expectations. And if we'll just learn to open our hearts to him and shut our minds, the sense realm, to the devil. Hallelujah. Let me go on down here just a few minutes more. Verse 7 says, For he that is dead is freed from sin. Now, if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. Knowing that Christ, being raised from the dead, dieth no more, death hath no more dominion over him. For in that he died, he died unto sin once, but in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. Likewise, reckon, reckon, you, your, you also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Now, verse 12, a very key verse. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body that you should obey it in the lust thereof. Now, let me give you a little Wingate translation. Let not demons, therefore, tell you what to do in your mind, that you should obey them in their lies and deceitfulness. Psalm 35, David talks about the situation. He says, let the angel of the Lord chase them that persecute me. He said, say unto my soul, O God... That you're my salvation. We'd think that human beings would be after David until he mentions the word soul. A person can, a human being can mutilate, kill another person, but he can't touch the soul. Spiritual enemies or entities, spiritual beings. One of the greatest blessings that I've had in my 29-year walk with the Lord now is for God to put into my hands a book that just 
uncovered the works of the devil like nothing else I've ever read. And thank God they have it right here at the camp meeting. It's Jesse Penn Lewis and Evan Roberts, and the title of the book is War on the Saints. It exposes the devil like nothing else will. Deceiving spirits, lying spirits. It took me a year to buy the book when I first saw it. I got talked, I listened to my head, thoughts. The enemy's doing his utmost through my mind, making me think that the thoughts that I was thinking was mine. When they weren't, they were his. And I got talked out of it for a solid year. Then when I got the book, it was another year before I could dig into it and even get in anything in it. Pick it up and say, oh, I'm going to go sit down and read this book a little bit. Well, hey, uh, wait a minute. Can you do that? You know, can you, honey, do this and, you know, telephone ring, something go on. We'll never be good soldiers in God's army until we learn how to wield the weapons of our faith. And the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. No, they're... 7,000 promises in the Word of God, someone said. I don't know. I never counted them. But I know that the Word of God is yea and amen. It's absolute. And I know that God watches over His Word to perform it. And I know that He said He would even hasten to perform His Word. And I know that He tells us to put Him in remembrance of it as if He forgot it. But He didn't forget it. He wants you not to forget it so that you can remind him of what it says and he can smile at you and say, yeah, that's right. You're remembering. That's what it says. Hallelujah. And it just gets better and better and better and better. I've got a little seven minute tape that Glenn hasn't heard yet, but I'm going to get him to listen to it. Benna listened to it. I had to run it back. It's seven minutes. And this man... In this huge meeting, they say the tape doesn't have a title. A friend of mine brought it to me. He don't know anything about it. But they say the man just walked up to the front of the auditorium this particular day and asked for the microphone that he had a word. And he speaks forth. And I, that's all I'm going to say about it. And we'll, we'll just uh, trust the Lord to let us listen to it. But, oh, man. And right down to the last of it, he's talking about God. He says, and you can't impeach him, and he's not going to resign. I've heard it six or eight times, and every time I, I, I hear that, I even say it, I, get a, I just get a charge down inside. It's just like as if the Holy Ghost said, yeah, that's the way it is. Praise the Lord. All right, let's go on here and get through with this. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, that you should obey it in the lust thereof, neither yield you, your members, as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin. That means don't yield your mind, your five senses. But yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead, and your members, or your five senses, as instruments of righteousness unto God. For sin shall not have dominion over you. That word dominion. It means sovereign or supreme authority, the power of ruling or governing. It means to dominate, to exercise control over, to tower above. You ever have something just driving at your mind? Just, it just seemed like it will not go away? That thing is towering above you? It makes you think that you're, you just will never make it in some way or other. That's right out of the pit. To tower above, to loom over, to rule, and so on. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law, but under grace. Grace. Someone come up with the acrostic, God's riches at Christ's expense. Grace. What then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law, but under grace? God forbid. Know ye not that to whom you yield your members or yourselves servants to obey, his servants you are to whom you obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. The choice is ours, always. Always. God wants us to have the liberty, the freedom, to make the choice 
whether or not I will say what's coming to my mind or whether I will not say it. Well, now, wait a minute. Brother George, sometimes it just gets so hectic and all of a sudden out it comes. Well, yeah, until you gain dominion over yourself. It can be done. I had a battle just the last week. A situation was going on and, and, and these thoughts were just flashing through my mind that I ought to say thus and such. I said, no, I, I didn't. I didn't really didn't say anything. I just knew where it was coming from. And I just took myself for a little stroll somewhere out of the vicinity of that area and just began to praise the Lord. We do not have to obey the devil. Don't have to. We're servants of God, not servants of the devil. But God be thanked that you were the servants of sin, but you have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you. Being then made free from sin, you became the servants of righteousness. Boy, what a good way to go. A servant of righteousness. Then Paul says, I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity of your flesh. For as you have yielded your members' servants to uncleanness and to iniquity unto iniquity, even so now yield your members' servants to righteousness unto holiness. Doesn't the Word of God say that without holiness no man shall see God? For when you were the servants of sin, you were free from righteousness. What fruit had you then in those things whereof you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. That's not necessarily a physical death either, folks. You yield your members as, as, as instruments of unrighteousness, and the next thing you know, you've got the death of a marriage. Or some other situation. Maybe a child takes off, runs away from home, too little to go anywhere. Need I say more? All kinds of situations. Well, I don't like what that person said. I ain't never going to talk to them again. The death of a friendship. Verse 21 and 22. What fruit had you then in those things whereof you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. But now being made free from sin. Being made free from sin. You don't have to sin, folks. And become servants to God. You have your fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting life. Good way to develop your armor is to say who you are. I'd like for you just to meditate on these things, take it home with you. Wherever you go to church or anywhere else, you might share it with others. But we as Christians need to begin to say who we are. You walk outside out there and get out there in the open and you take this thing and you say, I am a child of God. And you fill the air with that kind of talk. And you're planting seeds in the air. And God said his word would not return to him void. But it would accomplish what he pleases. Share it with others. Look up every scripture. Mark every scripture in your Bible. Highlight it. If you've got a highlighter, well, I don't mark my Bible up. Well, you better start. Just highlight that thing in. Make yourself familiar with the promises of the Word of God like you never have before. Because, folks, we're coming to a time when we're going to have to know what the Word says. Hallelujah. Well, glory. Well, I didn't think I'd get through that whole chapter, but I did anyway. Praise the Lord. Stand to your feet, please. Let's say some words together. Follow me, if you please. Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus. I thank you for your Word. It will be a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Oh, God, I want to be what you want me to be. Mold me, form me, make me into what you want me to be. Oh, God, have mercy upon me. Help me in the days to come to separate myself unto you. More than ever, that I might be like you more and more in the days to come. I thank you, Lord. I give you the praise and the glory 
In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Oh, that's right. It's dinner time. <laughs> thank you, Lord. Lord, we just thank you and we praise you. And Lord, our words just said, you know, search our heart, God. We say thank you because that's the only way we know to do it, really. But Lord, search our heart and give us a heart of thanksgiving. Father, we praise you and bless you today. This is your day. You made it. You brought it into being. We thank you for it. And we ask you now, Lord, to bless the food that's been prepared, the physical food for these physical bodies. And Lord, help us to learn even how to take better care of our physical being as, as your tabernacles, as your tents, that we might live long and that we might be strong and healthy. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. This is the end of this message. Our website is www.lakehamiltonbiblecamp.com and lhbconline.com. There are many free audio files there. It's like going to Bible school at home.